we're going to be talking about the most precious blood of Christ. As you know, we are in the month of July, and the month where we commemorate, celebrate the most precious blood of our Lord. Indeed, we should be doing that all year round. But in particular, in the month of July, focus upon the most precious blood of Christ. And we're going to enjoy ourselves. We're going to have a lot of fun. And God willing, people will be illuminated. God willing, people will be enlightened on a topic that maybe they simply didn't know about before. Now, the other question is, what is the significance of the devotion to the most precious blood? The answer is very clear. The devotion to the most precious blood emphasizes the sacrificial nature of Christ's death and the redemption that it offers to us. It specifically highlights the power of Jesus' blood in securing that forgiveness, that sanctification, and eternal life for believers. And if you look at the Old Testament, over and over you're going to find the foreshadowing of the significance of Jesus' blood. <clears throat> in particular, you have got that in the Old Testament. The blood of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, 13. Spare the Israelites from death, prefiguring Christ's sacrificial blood. Additionally, as we'll see in a moment, the covenantal blood sprinkled by Moses in Exodus 24 prefigures the new covenant established in Christ's blood. So <clears throat> we realize that in Exodus 12, the blood of the Passover lamb, which was smeared on the doorposts of the Israelites, served as a sign for the angel of death to pass over their homes. This event prefigures Christ, the Lamb of God, whose blood delivers from eternal death. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, an important thing to remember. And indeed, all of this is vitally important to remember because all of it, what is it doing? It is pointing towards Christ. Everything in the Old Testament foreshadows the arrival of our Lord and Savior, points to Christ and points to his arrival. And we look and we think about the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 describes the Day of Atonement where the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial animal on the mercy seat. <clears throat> this act of atonement for the sins of the people points towards Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, where his blood was shed for the remission of sins. Earlier, we spoke a little bit about Exodus 24, and indeed Exodus 24 is very important because the covenantal blood is sprinkled by Moses, and that prefigures a new covenant established how? Established in Christ's blood. In Exodus 24, we read, and indeed, the one important thing to remember is over and over as we're looking at these texts, we need to call to mind, to remembrance, that everything, again, is pointing towards Christ. So in Exodus 24, we read, Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, nor shall the people go up with him. So Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord. And he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins, and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. <clears throat> Vitally important to pay attention to all of this language, so, so important. Indeed, the covenant of blood in Exodus 24, Moses sprinkles the blood of the covenant of the people. This signifies the establishment of the Mosaic covenant. This covenantal blood is a prefigurement, a precursor to the new covenant in Christ's blood as mentioned in the New Testament. And indeed, we realize that everything again 
points towards Christ. These are shadows that are pointing to the arrival of the Messiah, to the arrival of the Christ, to the arrival of our incarnate Lord and Savior. And of course, we know that there is New Testament fulfillment. <clears throat> the New Testament explicitly connects the blood of Jesus with the themes of redemption, purification, and covenant. The institution of the Eucharist. During the Last Supper, Jesus instituted the Eucharist, identifying the wine with his blood. Matthew 26, 28, he says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. The Greek, by the way, there is ekhunomenon. Now, I cannot emphasize how important that Greek is because the Greek in Matthew 26 shows us that the blood is literally being poured out at that exact moment. The blood is being poured out right there, right there before their very eyes. This is the blood. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This declaration links his impending sacrifice to the new covenant prophesied by Jeremiah. Now, we stop and we think, okay, well, Jeremiah, what does Jeremiah prefigure? What is prophesied there in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34? And when we read Jeremiah 31 to 34, we read, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand, to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was a husband of them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord, for they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this very clearly, this is a hearkening when we read of these, this the Eucharistic sacrifice, hearkening to the sacrifices that were prophesied, sacrifices of the new covenant prophesied of in the Old Testament pointing to Christ. That's so important. So, so important. And with that in, in mind, we stop and we realize how vitally important it is to have a deep, venerate, a deep, venerable, a deep, venerable, and holy adoration of the Eucharist to realize you've got Christ right there before your very eyes, our Lord and Savior present there, Present sacramentally, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it incredible how supernatural our faith is? And indeed, throughout this whole month, as we remember, we celebrate, we honor, we worship Christ. We should worship him every day and every moment, every breath of our life. But throughout this month that we commemorate the most precious blood of Jesus, it's good at times to stop and sit back and think, okay, well, what exactly are we commemorating? What exactly are we celebrating? What does it mean? Where is it laid out in the Bible and biblically and in the early church fathers? Was this already recognized? We can tell you with a hearty amen it was. In the crucifixion, the gospels detailed the crucifixion of Jesus, where his blood was shed for humanity. John 19.34 highlights the moment when a soldier pierced Jesus' side and blood and water flowed out, symbolizing the sacraments of the Eucharist and baptism. That's correct. Symbolizing those sacraments, everything, everything that happens in sacred scripture is pointing to something. Everything that happens in sacred scripture is pointing to a biblical truth all the time. And in John, John 19.34, we read, but one of the soldiers, by the way, it was Longinus, we know, through sacred tradition. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. This, indeed, does highlight the moment when a soldier does, Longinus, by the way, St. Longinus, pierces his side, and blood and water flows out. Isn't it amazing how this 
clearly symbolizes the sacraments of the Eucharist and baptism. Just mind-blowing, incredible, just mind-blowing. In the letter of the Hebrews, the epistle of the Hebrews provides a theological masterful exposition, if I may add, the masterful portion, on the blood of Christ. Now, everything in Scripture truly is masterful. Everything is, but particularly the book of Hebrews is magnificent. One day, perhaps, we will do a Bible study from the Bible and the early church fathers just on the book of Hebrews, the letter of the Hebrews. You'll be blown away at how incredibly Catholic it is. But then again, the whole Bible, <laughs> the whole Bible is incredibly Catholic. So maybe you won't be blown away. Hebrews 9, 12 to 14. Let's read 11, beginning 11. It says, Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. With a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The letter of the Hebrews is contrasting the blood of goats and bulls with the blood of Christ, emphasizing that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, our incarnate God, entered the heavenly sanctuary once for all by his own blood, indeed obtaining eternal redemption. In the first epistle of John, 1 John 1, seven states, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, this verse is incredibly powerful, highlighting and underscoring the purifying power of Christ's blood. And that really is the heart of the message. That truly is the heart of what we are doing all month long. And certain people may be confused and may say, okay, well, where do we get this biblically? It's right here in the Bible. Or where do we find it in the early church fathers? In the moment, we're going to dive into early church history. We think you're going to love that as well, because we've got quite a few early church fathers for you. And if you've enjoyed this thus far, you're probably watching this, uh, maybe watching it on a premiere. Or if you are a patron, if you're a member of ours, you have early access to this. Thank you so much for your support. Please let us know down below if you are enjoying this. Let us know in the chat what do you think about it if you're watching on Premiere. And don't forget to flood the comment section for the algorithm. Do you like shows like this? Do you like this kind of theological material? If you do, please do not fear, do not fear to hit share, like, subscribe, and please flood the comment section. Do it for the algorithm. God bless you. In the first epistle of John, this this is clearly uh, uh, highlighting, masterfully high, highlighting uh, the purifying power of our Lord and Savior's blood. Now, the early church fathers indeed revered and strongly, strongly commemorated the blood of Jesus, seeing it as central to Christian faith and practice. Their writings provide a rich, a masterful tapestry, tapestry a theological reflection on this profound mystery. St. Justin the Martyr, in his dialogue with Trifo, and this is important because Trifo the Jew, by the way, at times Trifo uh, will stop and say, okay, well, we agree that this is what that Old Testament passage is about, but we disagree that Christ fulfills it. But what St. Justin the Martyr does so masterfully is he will over and over show how these events in the Old Testament have now come to be fulfilled in the Christ. And it's masterful because Trifle and the Jews traveling with him and those that read this afterwards over and over are going to understand St. Justin the Martyr's masterful exegesis of the Old Testament passages. And they're going to say, yes, okay, we understand that points to the Messiah. Yes, we understand. Um, these are. It's going to point to a new covenant, a, a covenant that is going to be perfected. Yes, we understand this. It'll be an eternal covenant. 
Uh, yes, we even at one point when they're talking about the suffering servant of Isaiah, even trifle the Jew admits, yes, that is about the Christ, that's about the Messiah, but we doubt that Christ fulfills all these things. But you see how over and over, seeing Justin the martyr is showing, well, look, historically these things have been fulfilled. In history, they've been fulfilled. Who ticks all of the boxes for having fulfilled all of this throughout history? It can only be Jesus of Nazareth. Thus, St. Justin the Martyr's apologetic approach was masterful. And in his dialogue with Trifo the Jew, he emphasizes the salvific power of Christ's blood. He connects, and masterfully so, the blood of the Passover lamb with Jesus' sacrifice. For the blood of the Passover saved those who were in Egypt, so also the blood of Christ will deliver from death those who have believed. This is amazing. Now, St. Justin the Martyr was incredible in his biblical exegesis, and who knows how many people converted because of his masterful understanding of the Old Testament scriptures, his masterful grasp of the New Testament as well, second to none, really. And in his dialogues with Trifo the Jew, you can see just how incredible and incredibly in-depth the great St. Justin the Martyr's theology truly is. And for that, we are so grateful that we have so many of his writings that have come down to us and we are able to feast on them spiritually. How amazing is that? St. Justin the Martyr, pray for us. We now come to the great uh, doctor of the church, just made a doctor not long back by Pope Francis. Thank you, Pope Francis. Uh, it was a long time coming. I think the great, the great, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, should have been made a doctor a long time back. Indeed, taught and trained by Bishop Polycarp. Now, who was Bishop Polycarp taught and trained by? By the Apostle St. John. So St. Irenaeus of Lyon is a magnificent apostolic uh, witness, not in the sense that he's an apostolic father, but he was taught and trained by an apostolic father who was taught and trained by an apostle. So the great St. Irenaeus in his work against heresies, articulates the role of Christ's blood and redemption. He states, for the blood of Christ, which was shed for us, purify the whole world and cleanses us from sin. Every chapter in Against Heresies is magnificent. Indeed, Against Heresies, which today is still incredibly relevant to our times in the sense that there are still some people glorifying Heresies along the lines of Gnosticism. I mean, yeah, that it's it's real. And uh, not only that, people denying the Catholic faith that St. Irenaeus strongly, strongly defended. So magnificent, magnificent work. And we think that another thing that we, we want to emphasize, we recommend, by the way, that you get a hold. Now, here's the great thing of St. Irenaeus. If you want to own and get a hold of his works in hard copy, they're, they're probably relatively affordable. If not, you can find them for free in New Advent. A New Advent is a great resource if you're just beginning. Even if you're not just beginning, it's a great resource. But of course, there's a lot of early church father stuff. There's a ton of material that simply just isn't available there. For material that is not available there, you're going to have to look elsewhere. I highly recommend the uh, CUA series, and there's many others. Just look for a great, great resource, and you're set with that. And we find the very same mind in the great Saint Athanasius of Alexandria. Now, the great bishop... Athanasius of Alexandria, originally a deacon, of course, would become a priest and, of course, a bishop, the masterful Saint Athanasius, famous for his incredible defense of orthodoxy, of the Trinitarian faith, famous for his defense of Jesus Christ as Almighty God. In his work on the Incarnation, he will explain the necessity of Christ's blood for human salvation. He will note masterfully for as much then as the children are the sharers in blood and flesh, he also himself in like manner partook of the same, 
that through death he might bring to naught him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might deliver them who, through fear of death, were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Look at that. Look at that language. So you'll notice how over and over, and we're going to find, we're going to encounter some just massively important language in just a moment. And not that we haven't yet, but just the fact that the early fathers had such a great and magnificent emphasis on the blood of Christ it should really tell you a lot. It should tell us a lot. It, indeed, it does. We think that it does. Indeed, we believe that we are so blessed to have such incredible, incredible writings that we still have present to us to this day. Just incredibly beautiful, just incredibly magnificent. The great St. Augustine of Hippo. St. Augustine of Hippo, who is on the Trinity, de Trinitate, is on Christian doctrine and so much more, is, are still standards to this day. One of the greatest early church fathers ever. One of the most magnificent patristic pillars you're ever going to encounter. The great Augustine extensively reflected in the blood of Christ in his writings. In particular here, by those sacrifices of the old law, this one sacrifice signified in which there is a true remission of sins, but not only is one forbidden to take as food the blood of this sacrifice, rather all who wish, wish to possess life are exhorted to drink thereof. Now we are going to close out. We will conclude our show on the precious blood of Christ by answering certain objections or certain questions that people may have. Earlier, we pondered upon what the significance of this devotion was. And to go over it, the devotion to the most precious blood emphasizes the sacrificial nature of Christ's death and the redemption it offers humanity. Indeed, it highlights the power of Jesus' blood in securing forgiveness, sanctification, eternal life for believers. Where is there any kind of foreshadowing in this? Now, how does the Old Testament foreshadow the significance of Jesus' blood? Well, in the Old Testament, as we pointed out, the blood of the Passover lamb, which, as you know, spared the Israelites from death, directly points to and prefigures Christ's sacrificial blood. That is why you read what you read in the Great Fathers. That is why you're able to read what you read in the Great and these great masters of the faith, the great Augustine and the great St. Athanasius, the great St. Irenaeus of Lyon, St. Justin the Martyr, and I can go on and on. They know this. But indeed, we also partake of the blood of Christ. When we go to Mass, every time we go to Holy Mass, every time we are so blessed to be able to attend Holy Mass. Isn't that wonderful? You stop and you think, and earlier we looked at Matthew chapter 26, 28, just briefly, we heard about Matthew 26, and we'll read it for you indeed, so you can get a fuller picture of what we're talking about in Matthew 26. Because in Matthew 26, we read of the new covenant blood. Let's check it out. Indeed, when our Lord and Savior institutes the Lord's Supper, he says, and as the Bible tells us, the author of the Gospel of St. Matthew, St. Matthew tells us, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, let's pause for a moment. Because when he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you, it's literally, literally should read, which is being shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Being shed for many. It's literally being shed for many at that exact moment. The Greek is ekhunamenon. It's literally being shed right before their very eyes. 
So with all of that in mind, you stop and you ponder and you wonder, okay, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? What are the theological implications? And well, what are the devotional practices? Now that I know that the precious blood of Jesus is important. Well, theologically, the precious blood of Christ is central to the doctrine of atonement. Did you know that? I'm sure a lot of you are saying, William, I already knew that. Well, if you didn't, great. If you did, well, you know what they say, repetition is helpful, and I hope you've still been edified. Central to the doctrine of atonement and, of course, to the doctrine of redemption. And, of course, being made holier in the Lord, growing in holiness. I need the Holy Eucharist. Every time I go to Holy Mass, I need to partake of the body, the the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. That's what I crave. So the early fathers craved. And devotionally, what about devotionals? What can you do to be more devotionally dedicated? Well, some people tend to ask, okay, what can I do? Well, there are practices such as praying and meditating on the Passion, partaking of the Eucharist, and invoking the blood of Christ in prayer to protect and to heal. All of this is deeply, deeply, shows a deep appreciation for the sacrificial love of our Lord and Savior. And that truly is what is the most important. That truly is what is being emphasized. That is really what is the most important thing for us to stop and think about. And of course, what is the evidence as well? You look in the early church fathers and what they say about the blood of Christ and what they have to say. And of course, the early church fathers were unanimous, were unanimous in believing that the bread and the wine truly became the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord. The early fathers taught transubstantiation so that in and of itself should show you we should have an incredible devotion to the most precious blood of christ they all taught transubstantiation now i know somebody may come back and say oh william they didn't use that word i know some use other words like transmutation there's other words like meteusias in the greek but ultimately they are all teaching the very same thing this will be wonderful and beautiful this is Benedict the Sixteenth, the late great Pope Benedict Sixteenth, Angelus, Saint Peter's Square, on July the fifth, two thousand nine. Indeed, timely because July indeed is a month where we commemorate the most precious blood of Christ. I think it'll be wonderful to close out the show, to close it out by reading this wonderful Angelus. Dear brothers and sisters, the first Sunday of July was formally marked by the devotion to the most precious blood of Christ. Several of my venerable predecessors confirmed this in the past century. Blessed John the 23rd with his apostolic letter explained its meaning and approved its litanies. The theme of blood linked to that of the Paschal Lamb is of primary importance in sacred scripture. In the Old Testament, aspersion with the blood of sacrificed animals represented and established the covenant, established the covenant between God and his people as we read in the book of Exodus. And Moses took the blood and threw it upon the people. And said, Behold the blood of the covenant, which the Lord has made with you in accordance with these words. Jesus refers explicitly to this formula during the Last Supper. When offering the cup to the disciples, he says, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And effectively from the scourging to the piercing inside after his death on the cross, Christ poured out all his blood as a true lamb, sacrificed for the redemption of all. The salvific value of the blood is expressly stated in many passages of the New Testament. Suffice it to mention, in this year for the priests, the beautiful words of the letter of the Hebrews, we read this earlier, Christ entered once for all into the holy place, not taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls, with the ashes of the heifer, sanctifies for the purification of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Dear brothers, it is written in Genesis, the blood of Abel, killed by his brother Cain, cries to God from the earth. 
And unfortunately, today as in the past, this cry never ceases. As human blood continues to be shed because of violence, injustice, and hatred. By the way, this is relevant even to our time today. When will human beings learn that life is sacred and belongs to God alone? When will they understand that we are all brothers and sisters? To the cry which rises from so many parts of the earth for the blood that is spilled, God responds with the blood of his son who gave his life for us. Christ did not respond to evil with evil, but with goodness, with his infinite love. The blood of Christ is a pledge of God's faithful love for humanity. Every human being, even in conditions of extreme moral wretchedness, can say, fixing his eyes in the wounds of the crucified one, God has not abandoned me. He loves me. He's given his life for me. And thus rediscover hope. May the Virgin Mary, who at the foot of the cross, together with the Apostle John, received the testament of Jesus' blood, help us to rediscover the inestimable richness of this grace and to feel deep and everlasting gratitude for it. God bless you, everybody. Hope you've been edified by this. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe if you haven't yet, and to flood the comments section for the algorithm. God bless you. God keep you. We'll see you soon.